Welcome back to our Bible study on 2 Peter. We're in chapter 3 today, and in fact, we're going to be finishing up the book. We will then have a, a series on 1 Peter, already saved on a playlist there in our YouTube station, Just Plain Bible Study. And today we're going to finish up 2 Peter, and so we will have all of the letters of Peter covered and available there in playlists for those who would like to watch through those studies. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy and life-giving word, especially that revealed to your servant, St. Peter. And we ask, dear God, as we study this final word from the Apostle, that our hearts might be filled with faith, that we might be strengthened to serve you and one another. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So let's jump right in. I'm going to read verses 1 through 4 to get us started. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, says Peter. And he calls them beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord Jesus, the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. So let's take just those few verses there and talk through those the first. Of course, he's referring to that uh, the letter First Peter, as he describes here that he's writing now a second letter. And as, as we've discussed in earlier sessions, this is the last correspondence we have from St. Peter before he goes to martyrdom. And he writes in particular with this in view, that he's sharing the gospel, the word and encouragement for the last time with, uh, with uh, his, uh, his disciples here as he teaches them about the way of the Lord. And I think it's interesting, the term that he uses to describe those who are reading this letter is beloved. Beloved. He has this sincere and sure care. St. John especially likes this expression. He, uh, he uses it often in his letters, and we know that Peter and John were close, close companions, following closely with the Lord Jesus Christ. They would have worked perhaps together in the fishing industry. They knew each other from Capernaum there, and so they both use this expression to describe the disciples of our Lord and those who had followed and, and believed with them. In the gospel they are and you are beloved in both of them that is in both of these letters I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the Holy Prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior through your Apostles so he's the the point of the letter is to stir up and bring to remembrance things they've already learned uh, just as we all go through in our early years, um, for most of us go through in the early years, the catechism and learn those basic teachings of the faith. And yet we benefit greatly when those are stirred back up in us and we're reminded of those teachings that are foundational to our lives. So here Peter is stirring them up and bringing back to remembrance these essential teachings. And he mentions too, here at the end of his letter, that you should remember the predictions of the Holy Prophets. That's the Old Testament, right? In the previous chapter, he's given us five different examples from the Old Testament of teachings and how the God, uh, God keeps his people sincerely and faithfully uh, against the false teachers. So remember those predictions, the prophecies and fulfillments. We emphasize that especially at Emmanuel uh, in the uh, Christmas season, for example, we just had, we were reading prophecies of the Old Testament and the fulfillment in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and these stir us up in our faith. The second thing he says um, are the commandments of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. So he's thinking here about, uh, well, not the commandments of the Old Covenant, that would be under that first category, and we all learn and study the Ten Commandments, but he's got a different commandment in mind. A commandment that comes especially from the Lord and Savior. 
and we celebrate and remember this commandment on well it's coming up a, a day called Monday Thursday Monday Thursday when we read a passage in st. John's Gospel where Jesus tells his disciples to love one another a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another and in particular love one another as I have loved you and that kind of takes the love that's commanded and taught in that old covenant and takes it to a new level because we all know the kind of love that our Lord Jesus Christ showed uh, as, as he went to the cross and gave his life greater love has no man than this that he lay down his life for his friends and that's the kind of love in that commandment of our Lord that is being called to here. Verse 3, knowing the, this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. So the first thing you need to know, Peter is telling us about the last days, is that they're going to be people scoffing. And you may say to yourself, well, what exactly is scoffing? And probably the easiest parallel word for us to use in uh, in English would be mocking mocking people are are making fun of the truth of the gospel people are scorning the truth of the gospel a scoffer is somebody who Ugh, I don't need that what are you talking about that why why is that important to you it doesn't matter to me that's that's the attitude of a person who is a scoffer and the last days, he warns us, are going to be filled with this kind of an attitude. And if you think for a moment about what's going on out there in the culture, especially American culture these days, we see an awful lot of this scoffing. There is scorn for the Christian faith and for the way of our Lord, uh, especially that way of love that he's talking about, the commitment of loving as Christ loved, <laughs> uh, first of all, it's humanly impossible, right? So how, why is the Lord asking us that? We can't even keep that. And the world has an attitude of not even wanting to try to walk in the way of the, the Lord Jesus Christ, to live as Jesus lived among us. And so they are scoffers. They don't believe. Here's what they are saying. Uh, they will say, verse 4, Where is the promise of of his coming you remember that jesus before he rose into heaven told the disciples that he was coming again in acts chapter one uh, jesus ascends into heaven before them and the angels come and say to the disciples what are you standing around looking up for <laughs> you've got things to do jesus is coming back they tell them in the same way that you have seen him go along with that lord's teaching is the promise that he is coming again. But the scoffers are getting tired of waiting and they're giving up. Ah, nothing has changed. This is, listen to what they say. For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. Peter here is quoting the kind of scoffing that he was hearing in his day. And we might hear the same thing among our family, friends, or neighbors even today everything goes on just as it was before there's no change and yet let's think about that has anything changed since the beginning of creation and the answer is yes and when we went over this together in class on sunday morning there are a number of examples came out in the discussion for example the fall into sin has come since the beginning of creation and that has dramatically changed people's lives and the way we get along with one or don't get along with one another as the case may be so sin entered into the world and brought all kinds of, of trouble uh, the giving of the covenant through moses the promises that were there promises fulfilled in the coming the first coming of our lord jesus christ we see jesus keeping those covenant promises of the lord our god fulfilling the way of the lord this is not something that's happened before. Uh, a great example is what happened in the days of Noah, a universal flood, a worldwide judgment. And we're going to see here that Peter is turning toward that emphasis on judgment that is coming. 
uh, that uh, Jesus is delaying, but it's a delay of the judgment that is coming. We'll talk more about that in a moment. So the flood is another example of how things have been different since the beginning of creation. Uh, we might talk about the formation of the church and the spread of the church. There's a billion Christians worldwide. That is not what it was like in the beginning when it was just kept, the gospel was kept in a narrow, small family, the descendants of Abraham so many thousands of years ago, but now is embraced around the world by people of every tribe, nation, and language. The biggest change since the beginning of creation is this fact that Jesus did come. He did come as promised. Perfect God, perfect man, in one person, come for your and my salvation. This is like nothing seen since the creation, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, born of God, for us and for our salvation. Things have changed. The scoffers have it all wrong. They have it completely wrong. God is at work and he's working to accomplish the blessings that he promises in and through his son, our savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse five, here is how Peter continues. For they deliberately overlook this fact, overlooking things, that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. So he takes us back to the beginning and God's creative work and how it's through the word, through the word of God. You remember what happens in Genesis chapter one, God simply speaks, let there be light. And there is the creation. There's that power of God that brings the creation into existence to begin with. And the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, verse six, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. So there, that's the example of Noah's flood and a universal judgment brought by God upon fallen humanity, rebelling against the Lord, scoffing as Moses preached to them the way of the Lord, excuse me, not Moses, but Noah preached to them the way of the Lord and called them with warnings to back to the way of God and they simply would not listen. And the world that God created by water through his word then perished. Verse 7, things are going to be different when Jesus comes back. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire. Being kept into the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So the first judgment came through water out of which and through which the creation was brought about as God spoke his word over that water creation. But now there's a second element going to be involved in God's judgment at the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to come by fire. That's the new day of judgment and the destruction it says of the ungodly just as those people were blown away by the flood waters back in noah's day they will be blown away but this time by fire let's read on verses 8 through 10. but do not overlook look this one fact beloved there it is beloved again that with the lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day the lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. So let's take this part by part, starting in verse 8. Do not overlook this one fact, beloved. Oh, they are beloved. You are beloved in your Lord Jesus Christ. 
that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years are as one day. He's quoting the Psalms here. It's a reference to a passage in the Psalms that has this very same expression. Uh, we shouldn't take this and try to turn it into some numeration or counting, uh, but one of the um, one of the fellows in class pointed this out, and I thought it was a, a genius observation, that uh, a day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. It's been 2,000 years since Jesus first visited us, and to God it's like been two days <laughs> since, he, since he last sent his son to us. It's like almost no time has passed to God. God's not subject to time, is he? He's not bound by time and subject to time the way we are as human beings. We click off the moments. We try to measure the seconds and in microseconds. Time matters very much to us. And it does incredible things to us as we age and change in our lives. But God is timeless. He exists outside of time. He's not affected or bound by this at all. A day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years are as a day. Uh, we could even say 10,000 years are as a day with God. It doesn't matter before the Lord our God. And as we'll see here in a moment, there, God has other purposes and other plans and why he's doing what he's doing. Verse 9, the Lord is not slow. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness this is a human perspective that said god's god's not keeping up with what he said it's certainly not god's perspective and it should not be our perspective as people of faith who trust and wait and believe think of some of those old testament promises hundreds and hundreds of years old about the coming of our lord jesus christ those for by isaiah for example in his uh, his uh, passages he talks about the Christmas event, and it's 700 years before the fulfillment of that was. You can go all the way back to, to Moses, writing, and Moses says, uh, People of Israel, look for a prophet like me, whom the Lord is going to send to you. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter, I believe it's 18. And it's, uh, what, almost 1,500 years before that promise is fulfilled in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God's we're not going to be able to control or measure God. That's not our place. Our place is to trust and be patient. And that's the next thing that Peter says here. But the Lord is patient. The Lord is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. As we wait, as we look for the Lord to fulfill our promises, we should see in that time that is going past us the patience of a loving and gracious Father who wants to see this change in our hearts and lives and would have us tell others about his love and his call to repentance for their lives. Verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, will come like a thief. In other words, it's going to come as a surprise. If you knew when the thief was coming, you'd stay up, wouldn't you? And you'd wait for him. But we don't know. It's a surprise. And the day of the Lord is going to be a surprise when it happens, when Jesus comes again. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar. Think about the, the, the whoosh, that whooshing sound made by a fire when it when it balls up and bursts into flames. That's what Peter's referring to here. The day of the Lord, time of his coming, will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. The heavenly bodies here uh, is referring to all manner of God's creation. It's not just going to be a judgment confined here to the earth, but ca causing uh, change in all physical creation. We'll see that God has plans for all of this, but this is a part of his judgment. The judgment comes first before those other plans of God are fulfilled. 
the bodies will be uh, the heavenly bodies will be dissolved burned up and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed nothing will be hidden from God's sight nothing God sees and knows all and he will expose those things on the last day Lord have mercy on those who do not repent verse 11 since all these things are thus to be dissolved uh, all these things meaning the elements what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn but according to his promise we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells God's bringing about a big change all these things are going to be taking place it says and uh, the elements are going to be resolved what sort of people ought you to be if even the rocks are going to burn <laughs> And dissolve and we know they can right you see the lava come out that's rocks that melt uh, if even they can melt imagine how we ought to be changed metamorphosized and changed into the way that God has called us in his word what uh, sort of people ought you to be in lives of and this is the transformation holiness and godliness we will be metamorphosized, metamorphosized, and become gems and precious from the clay that we are today. Waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God. And this one's a little harder for us to understand, isn't it? That we can hasten, hasten the coming of the day of God. How do we hasten? How can the church hasten the coming of Jesus well we can hasten it by by spreading this word spreading this gospel into the lives of other people that they come to faith come to believe before that last day we can hasten this by prayer remember the uh, st. Paul has this prayer in in his letter to the Corinthians I believe it is he says Maranatha in other words Lord come the Lord would invite us to pray and to call for his return, that he would come back. And, and if I remember, that's how we'll end it on our prayers today at the end of this lesson, hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, even, even the heavenly bodies and uh, the, uh, the air, everything is going to be transformed in this moment of God's judgment. And the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn but according to his promise we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells and here Peter is thinking about things that are said especially at the end of Isaiah Isaiah 65 and 66 talks about this transformation the earth is going to be the creation uh, afflicted by sin, afflicted by our sin, is going to be transformed in God's judgment. And it's going to become a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. It's going to become heaven-like as God creates again his world for which he first created us. What a glorious day that is going to be uh, this is how Isaiah describes it he talks about the lion laying down with the lamb and the children are out playing and they're playing on the dens of, of serpents and adders poisonous snakes that would normally uh, terrify us and and make us think that uh, the kids are going to get killed but in this new creation all God's people and all God's creatures are going to get along peaceably what a change what a change comes after god's judgment here's the end of the letter therefore beloved again beloved for the third time in the chapter he calls us so since you are waiting for these 
Be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks to them of these matters. There are some things in them, that is in his letters, that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. And so Peter ends his letter. Let's now walk through back up to verse 14. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, and that waiting implies our prayers, right? Lord Jesus, come. Be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. At peace in our hearts, because we know the forgiveness of sins at peace with one another because we forgive one another just as we just as we pray in the lord's prayer right forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us this is the peace the peace that god has prepared for us in the lord jesus christ and if we know that peace and have that peace we're going to be without spot spot or blemish we're going to be like those pure lambs used in the Old Testament sacrifices, pure in every way without any, any blemish upon our lives. We're not perfect in this life, are we? But we can be at peace, and that peace makes us beautiful and pure in God's eyes. Verse 15, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation he was patient for you wasn't he he waited for you the judgment could have happened before before you repented but no he waited for you to be a member of his kingdom to be a member of his church count the patience of our lord as salvation just as our beloved brother paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him you may remember from reading or studying in the past uh, the book of Galatians that Paul and Peter didn't always see things eye to eye. Uh, Peter, uh, Paul there in the second chapter of Galatians talks about a conflict that arose between him and Peter. Peter was siding with some folks who were into the false teaching camp and uh, were teaching that you had to be uh, basically Jewish in order to be Christian. You had to go through circumcision and all the rituals of the Old Covenant in order to be acceptable before God. And Paul reminds him, no, Jesus fulfilled all of that and those things are not necessary for the salvation of the Gentiles. They were at times at odd and odds and yet Peter here calls him, as he's calling all of his readers, calls Paul beloved and calls him brother strive for that kind of peace with your brothers and sisters in Christ. He wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. It's wisdom by God, isn't it? Wisdom from God's Holy Spirit who inspired Paul, verse 16, as he does in all his letters when he speaks to them of these matters. So the people addressed by Paul in his letters, he talks about the coming of Christ. He talks about what to expect at the end of time. He talks about being beloved to one another and brothers to one another and uh, uh, the fulfillment of God's word and promise. Then Peter says this, there are some things in them, that is Paul's letters, that are hard to understand. Ain't that the truth? <laughs> there are times you'll be reading through the scriptures and you're understanding and you think you've got the sense of it and then you'll run into something and you'll wonder to yourself, what on earth? <laughs> what on earth does this mean? As I told the class uh, the other day, I was reading something in the Psalms. 
and uh, I, I came across a passage and I, I to this moment I don't know what it means uh, it's a confusing for me a confusing passage and I've got to do some more study on it and hopefully get a better grasp of it but there are things in the scriptures that we can't seem to fit into our own minds or, or some some uh, cultural thing that is lost to us that we can't appreciate what's being written there it doesn't mean that the scripture is wrong or an error it means that we're not living up to knowing it as we should um, there are things in the scriptures that can be hard to understand and here's peter's warning which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destructions as they do the other scriptures the false teachers see something that's uh, maybe harder to understand and they say aha this is their mindset aha here's a chance for me to introduce what i want to say and twist this in my way uh, i think especially of one of the last chapters in first corinthians first corinthians 15 where peter not peter but paul is talking about the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting and what that will be like and a number of heresies have been twisted out of things Paul says in that chapter things that get misunderstood and we always have to be careful to read the the harder passages of Scripture the more difficult passages in view of the clearer passages and let those clearer passages guide us when we run into these kind of uh, passages that you might trip over and stumble over if they were written by themselves no they're written in the context of scripture and we use that fullness to understand the fullness of the teaching uh, marvelous expression here from Peter he's writing in the last year of his life uh, before he goes to be a martyr and already people are collecting the letters of Paul we know from the manuscript traditions of the of the Greek New Testament that the letters of Paul are among the first things gathered and then shared and spread through the churches it's the beginning of what we call the New Testament and uh, Paul or, or Peter here uses a description of them that is really quite remarkable as they do the other scriptures they twisted the Old Testament he's saying and now there's twisting the the writings of Paul and he calls them scriptures he speaks of them with the same terminology as he describes that old covenant that sure revelation as he called it I believe it was in chapter 2 uh, or maybe chapter 1 uh, the surer revelation of that old covenant and he's comparing the letters of Paul with it they're like it they are God's word they are scripture inspired by him verse 17 you therefore beloved there's beloved again I believe that's the fourth time in the letter he addresses the people as beloved you therefore beloved knowing this beforehand all right I've warned you you know it's coming take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability so the goal of the Christian life is not to be swept hither and yon to and fro by the new winds of teaching that come out there you know how this is there's always some um, new person rising up and spouting something off that, that nobody's ever heard before and people get excited and go running after that instead of staying with the stability of the divinely inspired scriptures this is always what we come back to the scripture is our touchstone and our test for everything else that appears between now and when Jesus comes again and strive for stability strive as he said earlier in the chapter for peace these are the blessings that God gave, came to give us in the midst of a chaotic world destined for fire and judgment verse 18 but grow grow he says in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ think about a plant a plant is stable it's got roots right buried into the ground that makes it stable and yet it's not static is it 
it's not dead it grows it continues to grow and blossom and bear fruit and that's what your life is to be until Jesus comes again get that stability in the Holy Scriptures be rooted in God's holy and life-giving word and then thereby grow up into all that the Lord can have for you can be for you in this life that you would honor him each and every day in the way you live in the things you say the things you do for others and the blessings you speak upon them grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and he ends with this expression to him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity so between now and when those fires come that that burn up the, the the elements in that last judgment until then let everything be to the glory of the Lord our God let's bow our heads in a closing prayer dearest Lord Jesus Christ we thank you for the stability gained by your word and teaching and we ask O Lord our God that we would grow up in this grace and knowledge of you and all that you intend for us as your dear people keep us O Lord away from the false teachers who would mislead us and misguide us and stir us up about things that are not the truth of your word help us instead to remember dear Lord those predictions of the old covenant that are fulfilled the new commandment given in our Lord Jesus Christ to love as he loved and to carry this out day by day knowing that the patience of the Lord has redeemed us and saved us looking forward to his coming again indeed we pray come Lord Jesus amen <laughs>